presentation about native Android development. And let's uh, just begin. So before we get into the native Android stuff, I wanted to go over a couple of the, the projects that we have at Spring. One, and just differentiate between the two. First of all, Spring for Android is designed to provide a native um, extension to Android uh, based on Spring technologies. And our initial release has been focused around REST template and helping you include RESTful web service requests in your native Android applications. The Spring Mobile project, in contrast, is designed for helping you build Spring MVC applications that can also face a mobile client. So the, the real difference here is that one is a web-based client that's an extension of Spring MVC, and one is a native library designed for Android. So I just wanted to clarify the difference between those two projects, because you've probably seen them uh, being announced. So here's the agenda for today. We're going to do an Android overview and do a little bit of background and architecture overview of Android. Since this is the first Android presentation that Spring Source has uh, provided, that we wanted to make sure we covered some of the background information of Android. And then we're going to define the problem that we're trying to solve with Spring for Android and review what REST is, and then go through some basic REST template examples as well as an overview. And then we're also going to talk about Maven and how that can help you with your native Android application development. And at the end, we're going to go through a number of demos and with regard to the Spring Android Showcase. And then we'll have some time for questions and answers. So first of all, let's talk about Android adoption. Um, recently in the, the at the Mobile World Congress, Google announced uh, several figures around the adoption of Android. First of all, the year-on-year -year growth rate is more than 250%. And I, I personally find that astonishing. I mean, they're, they're really uh, spreading to all, all across the world, and Android devices are becoming ubiquitous. I, most carriers have them, if not all of them. The most astounding number to me is that 850,000 new Android devices are activated each day. This is really impressive when you think about it. Um, in comparison, Android has actually got a faster adoption rate right now over iOS, although you could probably, depending on when you look at those numbers, you could see that maybe they're leapfrogging each other a bit, just depending on when they make announcements. <laughs> Currently, there are over 300 million devices around the world. And what that means for you as an application developer is that there's plenty of audience there for your apps. As of right now, there's over 450,000 apps available. And just to speak about Google Play, if you haven't seen the announcement recently, Android, or excuse me, Google has rebranded the Android market as Google Play. And basically what they've done is brought the books and music and App Store all together and under this one umbrella called Google Play so that you have all of the content available in one section. And to go with that, they released these nice new icons. So if you have Android apps, then you need to update your website and marketing material with these. And as of right now, there are over 1 billion app downloads per month. And again, this is a staggering number. That's a huge number of downloads. And it just really, again, speaks to the, the breadth of the audience that you have available to you as a native Android developer. 
So we can't speak about Android without speaking about the Android fragmentation issue. And this is pie chart on this uh, slide is the latest update from the Google developer website. And as you can see, Android 2.3.3, which is gingerbread, has got over 62% right now. And in fact, that number is continuing to increase over all the other numbers. And in comparison, Android 2.2 now has, which is Froyo, now has 25.3%. Fortunately, that one's decreasing. But the one that's a little frustrating is that honeycomb and ice cream sandwich adoption are still just not growing at the same rate as Android 2.3.3 or Gingerbread. So you could see that every version of Honeycomb only accounts for 3.3%, and both versions of Ice Cream Sandwich only account for a total of 1.6%. So unfortunately, this, this means that we still have to focus on some of the older versions of Android in our applications. But this is also one of the things that Spring for Android hopes to address, and we feel like it does. So. Another point about Android fragmentation is not just the, these different versions. The carriers all have their essentially own version of Android that they're deploying to their phones. And what this means is that even if one phone is gingerbread and another phone is gingerbread, they may not necessarily be the same. So one phone may have an odd extra library installed that the carrier wanted to include in their in their version. So the fragmentation issue really kind of goes beyond just the, the Android platform itself, and it goes to the, the carriers as well. So hopefully in the future, uh, we could start seeing some of this coming together and this fragmentation being a, a little more resolved. So how is Android familiar, Android development? Well, applications are written in Java. And you have to caveat that, because they're sort of written in Java. And yes, the syntax is very similar. It, it, excuse me, it is the same as Java. But unfortunately, the applications are not the same. The way that you build them and, and deploy them, it's not standard Java. So there is some learning curve associated with that. But the good news is, is that the syntax and the language should be very familiar to you as, other, as traditional Java developers. So what else about it is not that familiar? Well, Android apps are compiled to class files. And those class files are then compiled into the Dalvec executable format, the D, or the DEX format. The DEX format is required to run on the Dalvec virtual machine. And the Dalvec VM is not a true Java virtual machine because it does not operate on Java bytecode. And this is an important distinction to make between uh, the regular G J JVM and Dalvec. Um, this means that there's going to be some incompatibilities between some existing libraries that you might uh, want to use on Android versus not, um, it, it, excuse me, in a regular Java application. So Dalvec is based on a subset of the Apache Harmony project, and many of the classes are from Java SE are, are available, but not all of them. And going back to the Android fragmentation, as Android has matured, some of those classes have been continue to be improved and added into the newer versions. So it's one thing you have to keep in mind is when you're developing for one particular version of Android versus another one, you just need to be aware that sometimes an API level is not going to have all of the, the same um, classes in it that maybe a newer version would. Or say there's going to be bug fixes in the newer version versus an older version. So let's speak a little bit about isolation of an app. 
um, what, how does an app exist on an Android device? Well, Android OS assigns each app a unique Linux user ID when it's installed on that device. And within the Dalvik virtual machine, each app is running in its own Linux process. So you could see just with those two things that the apps are going to be fairly sandboxed and isolated from all the other apps. And this was entirely by design. And in addition, the life cycle of the application is managed so that you're not starting and stopping the app on your own. The actual system is starting and stopping the app based on um, a, a function of the Android system called an intent. And when the app is requested to be started by some other area of the system. The <clears throat> so let's go over some of the components of an Android app. These are the four main components, and, and all Android apps are going to have one or more of these components included in them. Activities represent a single screen within a, a user interface. And if you use an Android phone, then all of the, the UI um, screens that you see with all your apps are based off of activities. Services are components that run in the background, and they may be long running or pro do work for remote processes, for example. Um, one really good example of a service is location service. So location services are running in the background, and you as an application developer can request the uh, geolocation of your device from the location service. And that's independent of your application. Your application doesn't have to know how to figure that, to, to figure out how to query the hardware for that. So contact provider manages a shared set of application data. And this may be a SQLite database or some other form of data store. A good example of this is the contacts information. So if your application wants to um, re request a list of contacts that are available on the phone, then a content provider is going to provide the API for being able to access that data. So the contacts are, are accessible to other applications. A broadcast receiver is a component that responds to system-wide broadcast announcements. And for the best example of this is, say, when you receive a phone call on your Android device. Um, you can have your app be notified or receive the broadcast about receiving that phone call. And if you needed to save some state or something, then that would be a good point to do that, since likely the user is going to answer the phone or Otherwise, leave your application at that point. OK? So here's a very basic Android manifest. And the Android manifest is an XML file that lives at the root of an Android project directory. It contains the permissions requested by the app, and it lists all of the components of an app. Some of the highlights are you need to specify the minimum SDK version that your app requires. So in this case, we've specified 10, which corresponds to Android 2.3.3, uh, which is genderbred. And in this section here, every activity has to be defined for your application. If your activity is called and it's not in this manifest, then your Android application is going to force close and basically crash. So you need to configure and specify every activity in your Android manifest. And in this case, we've got an activity named Hello Android Activity. And down here, we've also defined an intent filter. This intent filter tells Android that this activity is the main activity. So that means that when the application has started, this is going to be the main entry point into the application. 
So here's the simple activity that we had defined in the Android manifest. You could see that hello Android activity extends activity, which is Android activity. And then there's one method that's overridden from activity. That's called onCreate. And within onCreate, you could set your content view. And setting content view is, is how you would uh, define the UI for this activity. UIs are defined in layout files. And so in this case, we've got a layout file called main. And layout files are XML files that live in a resource directory within the Android application. Alternatively, you can build your UI programmatically. Uh, obviously, that's going to be a little more tedious than just simply using the layout file, but that is one option as well. So I'd like to switch over to STS, and I'm going to illustrate how to run uh, that sample Hello World application. So this is the Hello Android. All I did was create a new Android project, and I haven't done anything else. This is what you get when you create a new Android project using the Android Developer Tools plugin for Eclipse. You can see that we've got our activity here. Now it's exactly like what I had in the slide. We've got our Android manifest, which again is the same thing that was in the slide. And then here's our main XML layout. And layouts all are define this configuration about how to place and order the different widgets on the screen. In this case, we're using a linear layout. And linear layout just simply places the widgets from the top of the screen in order to the bottom of the screen. Um, in this case, we only have one lay uh, or excuse me, one widget, which is a text view, and it's just displaying a string variable called hello. And strings are also you can also define those as resources. And in this case, we've got a strings XML file. And right here, string name, hello. So that's how all of these things get tied together. So let's run the sample application. And there you have it. Very simple. <laughs> so let's move on. How can Maven help with developing your Android applications? Well, let's first of all discuss a little bit of the background uh, between Google and the different projects that were trying to get the Android jar files into the Maven repos central repository. Um, a group of people were had initially approached Google to get permission to do that, and unfortunately, Google Uh, unfortunately, Google did not allow them to post the real Android jars into Maven Central. So a few projects have come up to work around this um, dilemma, if you will. Uh, one of the first ones was Android for Maven. And this project, the, the goal of this project is to actually pull the source code for, from the open source version of Android and then it recreates the Android jar with all stubbed out implementations of all of the methods. So what this means is that you can compile against this Android jar, but you cannot run with it, of course, because the first time you made any call to any of the Android APIs, your application would throw an exception. So another project that was developed to help with this was called the Maven Android SDK Deployer. And with the Maven Android SDK Deployer, you can actually deploy a, um, Android, a real Android jar to your local Maven repository. So 
this is actually the only route you have if you want your application to use the Google Maps because Google Maps is still proprietary and they have Google has not open sourced that that code. So it's not available in Maven. So if you want to use Google Maps, you actually have to deploy the, that jar via the Maven Android SDK deployer to your local Maven repository. So now that we do have stubbed out versions of Android jar in Maven, another project has come along to help integrate Maven with Android development, and that's the Android Maven plugin. This is a, a becoming a very mature project, and I, I've become a really big fan of this. I, I highly recommend looking into the Android Maven plugin, and we'll take a look at how it can help you in the next slide. So here's Android Maven plugin configuration. First of all, if you're familiar with Maven in traditional uh, web, Java web apps, then you know the packaging would have been a WAR file. So if you're using the Android Maven plugin, then you're gonna, you need to change it to an APK file so that uh, obviously you, you want to build an APK for an Android device, not a WAR file. And the Android Maven plugin understands that packaging type. So here's the very basic boilerplate configuration for the Android Maven, uh, Maven plugin. The thing to highlight here are, is the SDK. So if you want to target a specific version of Android, this is where you would configure that in the Android Maven plugin. If we look at uh, Maven Central, you could see that the following versions of stubbed out versions of Android are available in Maven Central. And one of the things that you'll note is that there are no Honeycomb versions. So you may or may not be aware, but none of the Honeycomb versions have been op open sourced. And so none of the those stubbed out jars are going to be available in Maven. Fortunately, Ice Cream Sandwich is available as open source, and obviously there is a version of Ice Cream Sandwich available to compile against um, in Android, or excuse me, in Maven. So let's go back to the slides. So once you have the Maven Android plugin configured and you've created a POM file in the root of your Android application, you can use Maven um, command line goals to actually build and deploy your application to an emulator or a device. So you're probably familiar with a traditional Maven clean install, and the same thing applies to an Android application. You can also start the emulator via the Android plugin. You can deploy, and then you can also run. If we look at the documentation for this, <clears throat> you can see that there's quite a few goals available for the Maven Android, the Android Maven plugin. And I do recommend that looking at this uh, documentation because they really have done a, a great job exposing a lot of features in this uh, plugin. So moving on, let's take a, a quick look at this in action. So here's the Spring Android Samples repository. You can see the samples. It's located in GitHub at spring source slash spring Android samples. And if you clone the repository, we can go into one of the sample projects, which is the Spring Android Newsreader. And then from here, you can run the Maven Clean Install. And if you've used Maven before, then you're familiar with all of this stuff <laughs> that they uh, put up on the screen. But it's all pretty interesting. You can see that uh, 
one of the plugins is running DEX and it's pulling in the dependencies. And this is really what Maven could give you is the dependency management. And we can do an Android deploy. The one really nice thing about the latest version of the Android Maven plugin is that it prints out all of the activity lists. So you can, this is basically it's the, the manifest file that it's displaying. Now we could do a Maven Android run. And if you see our emulator is not on the application right now, but running this uh, goal of the Android uh, plugin brings up the sample application. So the Android Maven plugin, I, I believe, is very powerful. And in conjunction with the, the Spring for Android project, we find it to be extremely useful. You're not required to use Maven. Certainly, you could pull in the Spring for Android jars into your project, um, like a traditional, uh, normal Android project. But it certainly can be beneficial to have the dependency management available for you. So let's take a look real quick at the, the POM file for this newsreader sample application. You can see that the Android platform, these are all the properties specified. If you're not familiar with Maven, essentially these are variables with uh, values associated with them. It's nice to group these at the, the top of the POM file so you can easily see what all versions of dependencies that you're using. So first off, you can see that we're using the Google Android uh, dependency. And the thing to note here is that the scope is provided. So what this means is that the Google Android jar file, remember that stubbed out, is not going to be compiled into your Android application. So it's included as provided so that you could compile against it, but it's not going to actually be included. And this is how this is why we really feel like project is useful with Spring for Android is because the Spring for Android jar is available in Spring Source's uh, repository at the moment. When it's released, it will actually be available in Maven Central as well. But you can see it's easy to configure a dependency for that. And then we're also using the Android Roam feed reader, which is another dependency. You can see that one right there. And if you scroll down, you can see that there's the exact same Android Maven configuration that we showed in the slide a few minutes ago. OK. So let's go back over to the slides and continue on. So that's Maven from the command line, essentially. but there's also some really good support for Maven in Eclipse, and that's the Android configurator for M2E. And this is a, a really nice tool that's a plugin for Eclipse. And what it does is it integrates the M2 Eclipse um, plugin, the Android Developer Tools, which is the ADT plugin for Eclipse, and the Android Maven plugin. It brings all those three things together, and it allows you to build your application inside of Eclipse and still have the Maven dependency management. It's very powerful. And as you can see, I'm in Spring Source Tool Suite now, which is based on Eclipse. And we've got a POM file. And we have Maven dependencies here. And this is all provided to you, the integration by the, the M2E Android configurator. Uh, lastly, there's another project that's called the Maven Android Archetypes. And this is designed to help you bootstrap very quickly an Android project using Maven. 
and to go from no project to up and running very quickly. And those archetypes are available at the at GitHub URL, and I definitely recommend looking at those too. So let's change gears and talk about Spring for Android. We've covered some of the basics of Android and how Maven can help you build some native applications. So let's talk about Spring for Android and what we're trying to achieve with that. So what problem are we trying to solve? So some of the concerns are REST has become a popular choice for architecting both public and private web services. And the Android runtime provides HTTP clients capable of making HTTP connections and requests, but it, but it does not have a fully featured REST client. So what this means is that with the HTTP clients, there's certainly ways to uh, achieve what we are doing with REST template, but it's either going to be specific to one web service that you're doing, or you're going to have to change that method for each different um, web service that you want to do. Um, so we're really trying to make an abstraction with REST template that is a reusable pattern that you can use on every web service and marshalling with different data types. And we really feel like REST template um, helps you achieve that. So a little background of REST. The term representational state transfer was introduced and defined in 2000 by Roy Fielding in his doctoral dissertation. <clears throat> his paper suggests the four design principles listed below. So primarily, we need to consider that you need to do CRUD operations based on HTTP methods explicitly called the post, get, put, and delete methods. Your HTTP request, REST request, should be stateless, which means you shouldn't be managing state in um, an application so that the that makes it the the REST request dependent on that that state. And URI should be very friendly. And then in addition, you should be transferring XML or JSON across these web requests and marshalling those into objects. So let's go over a basic REST template example. And this is a Google search example. We create a new REST template object, and then we specify a URL to the Google API's AJAX URL. And you can see here this um, highlighted red. That is the parameter value. That's how our, our notation works for REST template. You put these um, curly braces around your parameter in the query string. And then when you make a call via REST template, you can pass that parameter. And in this case, it's spring source. And that gets passed to that uh, query parameter. So this get for object method is going to marshal a string from the result and returns that to the string. So in addition, you, REST template does support multiple parameters being passed in the request. And in this case, 42 is going to be inserted into this hotel value. And 21 is going to be inserted into the booking value. So let's take a look at an example. We can start the Spring Android Showcase client. We do an HTTP GET and a Google search. And that's the basic example that we just showed. So let's look at the source code real quick.
So in this case, we've actually had to expand on that basic example because the search result does not return a media type that is recognized by default by the mapping Jackson HTTP message converter. So what we're having to do is set a supported media type so that we know that this message converter or this message converter knows that when it returns the request returns a MIME type of text JavaScript that it knows to convert that into from JSON into a Java object. So you can see here we're passing VMware into the query string. We're doing a get for object. And in this case, instead of returning and marshalling to a string, we're actually marshalling to a Java object using the mapping Jackson message converter. Okay. And we're going to go through some more demos in a few slides. So Spring for Android REST template. It's based on Spring Framework. It originated as a fork of REST template from Spring Framework. And the reason that we had the fork from Spring Framework is that there's some incompatibilities both in dependencies and in API calls within Spring Framework. And those did not work on Android. So we had to make some modifications to support Android, to support REST template on Android. The REST template class is the heart of the library, as you've seen in those couple of examples already. Everything that, that your RESTful requests are being made through the REST template object. There are six main entry points, and they correspond to the HTTP methods that we reviewed on the, the REST um, information. You've got delete, get, head, options, post, and put. And there's a number of overrides for these methods. And you could just uh, review those and find one that meets the, the need of your current um, request that you're trying to make. Now, ultimately, all of these methods are going to drill down to either exchange or execute. So exchange and execute also are, are just the most flexible of these methods. And you saw that in that last example that we were actually using an um, exchange to uh, set the HTTP headers in the request since we had to uh, adjust the, the message converter for that. Okay? So let's just discuss the HTTP clients that we're using uh, with, within REST template. So Android's got two native HTTP clients. One is the standard J2SE facilities, and the other is the HTTP components HTTP client. And these are both exposed in REST template via the simple client request factory, and then also the HTTP components re request factory, respectively. And in addition, we still support the commons client Although the Commons HTTP client is not native to Android, and you would have to include that as a, a separate dependency. And so uh, it's deprecated both in Spring Framework and in Spring for Android. And we do, do not recommend using it, but if you have some specific need for it, then it's still available. So one thing to note about these two different HTTP clients, Google has recommended that in gingerbread and newer that you use the standard J2SE facilities. And we have exposed that, uh, well, not exposed it, but design REST template to also acknowledge that. So when you create a new REST template object, it's going to check which version of Android you're on. And if you're on gingerbread or newer, then it's going to utilize the simple client request factory. 
And if you're on a version older than Gingerbread, then it's going to use the HTTP components. OK. So briefly, we've sort of talked about message converters and the, the examples already. But the idea of message converters is that these are based on interfaces. So you can have as many types of message converters as there are things to convert. <laughs> so right now, these are some of the ones that we support in Spring for Android. We have the Mapping Jackson HTTP message converter. And this is the default one that we use for JSON marshalling. It does require a third party um, include, which is the Jackson library. We also do support the JSON library, although we do not default or try to wire the JSON library up anymore. We have one uh, reported issue where an older version of JSON was being installed by one of the vendors um, in, in Android distribution. And so it was conflicting with the JSON library loading automatically in REST template. But JSON is available to add and configure manually. And we also have the simple XML message converter, and this is how we handle XML marshalling. So this is all, it's important to note this is not a Spring Oxum XML serializer, or Spring Oxum compatible. Um, but simple does support Android, and it works quite well. So we also support RSS and Atom feeds through the Android Roam feed reader. OK, let's take a look at a couple more Android uh, showcase examples and look at some more sample code. So one of the important things about reducing your bandwidth usage in the mobile device is to gzip the content. And we've got a couple of examples here. And this compressed string is going to make a request to Twitter. It's going to ask for a gzip encoded response. And you can see that it's actually JSON that comes back. But we're not marshalling it in this particular example. You can see that the content link coming back is about 10K. Now, if we run the same example requesting an uncompressed response, you can see that it's actually much larger. So from a performance aspect in your Android application, we do recommend that you use GZIP compression when available. So let's take a look at that. And here's how you can set the accept encoding header for a GZIP request to, to make REST template ask for a GZIP response.
that we're getting from the text box. And then we're expecting a string from the server, and so we're just returning that to a new string object. So as you can see, it's it's very simple to, to post. Now, what about something a little bit more complicated? Look at a JSON or XML. Say you want to send some sort of message. And now we can post the JSON. And you see the response come back from the server. And right here you could see our little server received the ID subject and text. And let's take a look at this, how that works. So, in this case, right here, we're retrieving all of the information from the text fields. You're getting the text from the uh, different edit text fields that were in the layout. And we're actually setting that into a new message object. And this is what the message object looks like got an ID subject and string that corresponds directly to what that UI looked like on the screen. So now that we have a just a regular object, what we could do is populate the message object to serialize in HTTP headers. So this is our message and you're setting it up you're populating it in the HTTP entity, and you're specifying that it's a message. And then you create a new REST template object, and then we're using the exchange method again for this. And you can see it's an HTTP post, and we're expecting a string in response. So in this case, we're using the Jackson JSON parser to marshal the request from a JSON, or excuse me, a, a Java object into JSON, and then REST template is sending that request to the server, and it's coming back as a, a string from the server. And the response and the request are independent, so you could have uh, JSON or XML or whatever come back from the server, and same thing with the, the request. You could send and receive um, different things. There, there's no dependency on what you send and receive. Okay. So let's see. We've got a couple other examples that we could look at in here. Um, let's see. If you want to send a parameter I think we actually already covered that. Oh, uh, one of the things that you can do is uh, set a request timeout. And in this particular example, we're sending a value to the server to tell it to delay a certain number of seconds. So we could say delay two seconds and request timeout three seconds on our uh, REST template request. And you can see our server is delaying the response by two seconds, and then it responded. Now, if we change that to a request timeout of one second, you can actually see that the request timed out, and you can see that we got a, a a socket timeout exception in our server as well. 
So let's look real quick how you can set that. So the request factory has a set read timeout method, and you can simply pass that a value, and that will cause REST template to uh, timeout after that certain amount of time. So let's go back over to the slides and see that we've got a few minutes left. So uh, let's go ahead and answer some questions and. See what so the question is, do you know if there's any plan to change the Android VM from Apache Harmony to Open JDK? And the answer is I do not know if there are any plans for this. I have heard that discussed, although I, I do not know if there are any firm plans. Uh, Another question is, being a software developer, I have been interested in learning mobile application development. What would you suggest to learn uh, about mobile application development? Well, there's different answers to this question, and I'd say it depends. Um, from a native application development standpoint, uh, Android and iOS are both extremely popular right now, and most businesses or organizations tend to want to have an Android or iOS application, native application. But there's also a growing trend because there's a number of platforms out there, uh, including Windows Phone and BlackBerry. Um, you want to be able to reach as many customers as possible. So HTML5 and mobile web have really been growing in their sort of interest in the community. So tools like PhoneGap are extremely valuable to deploy what is basically an HTML5 application that's wrapped up in a native uh, shell onto different devices. So you really only have to write your application in HTML5 and CSS, and then you can wrap it up in iOS or Android or uh, mobile or Windows Mobile or BlackBerry. So it, those are some really powerful tools to look at. Uh, does Spring Android integrate with Spring Security? Um, the answer is uh, sort of. So we've got um, support for Spring Social and Spring for Android. And I didn't have time to do any of the, the examples for that in this um, webinar. But we do have some samples in, in the Spring for Android showcase. Um, what we're using Spring Security with in Spring Social is for encrypting the uh, data in the SQLite database. So that's, as for right now, that's the extent of what we're using Spring Security for. Um, okay, how Spring, Spring Android handles only REST services, what about SQLite database connectivity? Okay, so the SQLite database connectivity is a connection